Hi, this is the recording to accompany the slides for the tissue level of organization lecture. My name is Dr. Alita Partasadarso and I'll be walking you through these slides. So the reason for um, including this diagram in this first slide is to actually show you the differences between what's normal and what's abnormal. So this is a section of the um, cervic cervical um, epithelium and what you can see here is in the normal epithelium the cells are very organized and structured in a fixed format whereas in the abnormal um, epithelium where it there is an arrangement of cancerous cells you can see that it's not very well organized there's an irregular arrangement of these cells and so you can see that they're very different this section from the section of normal epithelium so this is the study of histology the study of tissues as we've covered in a previous lecture so let's go on. So the second slide in this lecture, as well as all other lectures, is to actually give you an overview of the um, slides that are found within this. So what you can see over here is we're going to cover um, the different types of tissues that are found in the human body. So there are four different types of tissue. For the purposes of this lecture, we are going to cover the first two in great detail, and I'm going to briefly talk about the muscle and nervous tissue. As you can see here in the diagram on the right, what you can see here is that the nervous tissue consists of brain, spinal cord, and nerves. Epithelial tissue are covering and protective um, tissue. You've got muscle tissues. There's three different types of muscle tissues in the human body, and then there's um, a whole bunch of different types of connective tissue. And as I said previously, what we're going to do in this uh, lecture is focus on epithelial tissue as well as the general analogies of connective tissue. So let's start off by talking about tissue membranes. So a membrane is a thin layer that covers something. So in this case, a tissue membrane is a thin layer or sheet of cells that covers the external body surfaces, that covers organs, that covers internal passages, and that covers cavities in the human body. There are two different types of um, epithelium. The first type is an um, Sorry, there's two different types of membranes. The first one is made out of epithelial tissue, and then the second type is made out of connective tissue. When we look at epithelial um, membranes, there are three different types of epithelial membranes that are listed over here. So you've got the mucous membrane that line um, the um, hollow openings of the digestive, respiratory, urinary, and reproductive tracts. They are um, called mucous membranes because they contain mucous glands. And the purpose of mucous glands is to secrete mucus. And mucus is, is, is secreted in order to help with the transport of um, different items through these um, different tracts, systemic tracts in the body. The second type of epithelial membrane are the serous membrane. So the serous membranes line body cavity. They're closed off to the exterior um, of the body. So it lines the abdominal cavity, the peritoneum. It lines the um, lungs, the uh, uh, pleural cavity, and it lines the uh, um, opening that the heart is uh, located in, the pericardial cavity. And again, it produces fluid, and the fluid here helps to reduce friction and to minimize heat production as the different types of organs co contained within the serous membranes and contained within these body cavities move around. And then the third type of epithelial membrane is the cutaneous membrane, also known as the skin. We're going to cover that in the next lecture. And the skin, as you know, covers the body surface, and it's got a whole different um, 
uh, layers, it's got multiple layers to help to protect the body from desiccation or dehydration and from um, different pathogens, virus, um, parasites, bacteria from actually entering into the body. So those are the three different types of epithelial membrane. When we go and look at the connective tissue membrane, there is uh, one type, and that's a synovial membrane. So the synovial membrane lines most of the joints found in the body. It lines the synovial joint, and it produces fluid within the um, synovial joint in order to actually help most of the joints in our body um, actually move around freely. So let's go on and talk about the first tissue type, that is the epithelial tissue. So I've got over here just an overview of the epithelial tissue in terms of its properties. So you can see here, this is a uh, um, typical um, section of a type of epithelial uh, tissue. You can see here that the cells are located fairly closely together, right? There's very little space in between the cells. The uh, epithelial tissue is avascular, so that means there are no blood vessels found within so what happens is you've got blood vessels that run just underneath the epithelial tissue and that then uh, the blood vessels will transport the nutrients to actually nourish the ep epithelial tissue and will also carry waste that are produced by the epithelial tissue. Because the epithelial tissue is avascular, it limits how thick and how many layers are found in the epithelial tissue. The epithelial tissue, because it's um, often the covering tissue of an organ, um, it undergoes wear and tear. So when we think about the skin, you um, the epithelial tissue of the skin is um, constantly being replaced. And so that we can say that the epithelial tissue is capable of reproduction because it needs to be replaced frequently because when we walk around and live our lives, we're constantly um, bumping into stuff and um, we may actually have a scratch or a graze on our skin and that will mean that the epithelial needs to be replaced quite um, frequently. Function of the epithelial tissue are listed over here. So the main four functions are to protect us, our bodies from mechanical and chemical injury and from entry of foreign pathogens such as virus, uh, fungi, bacteria from entering into our body, right? And you know that our skin or and other epithelial um, tissue protects um, are deeper tissues from mechanical and chemical injury because it stops uh, chemicals, a lot of chemicals from entering into our body and it also helps to um, prevent mechanical injury of the structures underneath it. We also, our epithelial tissue also has a sensory function so it can sense changes in what's going on in the environment. So when we think about the skin, um, our nose, our eyes, our ears, we can actually, um, if, um, if we can sense with our skin, if there is hot water being uh, touching our skin or cold water or ice, or we can, we can sense if there are, um, there are mosquitoes or flies landing on our skin. And so all that sensory, all is, all of that is included in the sensory functions. The epithelial, epithelial tissue also produces secretion. So some, some types of secretion that different types of epithelial tissue produce include hormones, include mucus, include juices from the digestive tract, as well as sweat. And our epithelial tissue also acts as a barrier to control movement of gases, solutes, and fluids across it. And um, if we want easy movement of gases across the epithelial tissue, um, for example, in our lungs, 
Um, it means that the epithelial tissue in the smallest unit of our lungs is only one layer thick in order for gases for gas exchange to occur. In our digestive tract, in our small intestine, again, the epithelial tissue there is only um, one layer thick in order for nutrients to be absorbed. But if you think about the epithelial tissue of our skin, it has to be multiple layers thick so that things can't go through, right? So that chemicals can't go through, so, so that foreign pathogens can't go through. So again, the level of barrier protection depends on the location of the epithelial tissue. As you can see in the diagram in the top right, um, the epithelial tissue is organized into layers. So in this example, you've got an, an epithelial tissue that contains many layers, right? So you've got all the different layers over here. And then you've got um, two different sides. You've got the apical surface, which um, interacts with the external environment. And then you've got the basement membrane that helps the epithelial tissue actually connect to the underlying tissue, to the connective tissue, right? So you've got the basement membrane, and then below the basement membrane, you've got the connective tissue. In the diagram at the bottom, what you can see here is you've got the epithelial tissue up above, and then the basement membrane over here, and then um, deeper to the epithelial tissue, below it you've got the connective tissue. And so the basement membrane then connects the epithelial tissue to the connective tissue down below. There are two main types of epithelial tissue. One is a covering type, so the membranous epithelium, like I talked about in the previous slide. And then another, the second type is glandular epithelium. So glandular epithelium produce secretions, and glandular epithelium are um, split up into whether those secretions are released into the body, in which case they would be called endocrine glands, or whether those um, secretions are released outside the bodies, in which case they would be called exocrine glands, right? So endo refers to inside, exo refers to outside. And so you can see whether, um, you can actually tell whether um, the glands release their secretions into the body, in which case it would be endocrine glands, or they release the secretions out of the body, outside the body, in which case it would be an exocrine gland. As I said before, epithelial tissue are connected by cell junctions. And so what I'm going to do in the next slide, so when we go and talk about cell-to-cell -cell junctions that are found in epithelial tissues, what happens, as I said, is that epithelial uh, cells, cells of the epithelial tissue, are connected very closely to each other, and they're connected together by these cell junctions, and they don't have um, cell uh, material in between those um, cells. And so the most common type of cell-to-cell -cell junctions are called anchoring junctions. So you can see here that there are three different types of anchoring junctions depending on where they are located. These anchoring junctions provide strong and flexible connections. So the most common type are these desmosomes. So you can see here this is the cell membrane of cell 1, this is the cell membrane of cell 2, and what happens is you've got the system called a desmosome that actually um, glue or connect these two cells together. The second type of um, anchoring junction is called a hemidesmosomes, and so if you look at the location of these hemidesmosomes, they um, anchor the bottom layer of the um, epithelial tissue to the basement membrane. And then the third type of um, anchoring junction is called the adherence. And what they do is they form a belt. So you can see here, instead of being um, of ending over here, they form a belt around the um, inside um, of the cell and so they basically encircle the tissue with this um, type of anchoring junction. 
A second type of of junction that's not an anchoring junction are called is called the tight junctions. So in the tight junctions, there's really really no space at all um, between the cells. So you've got the intercellular space, and you can see here the tight junctions make or like super glue. They uh, don't allow. Um, really any space in between. And these tight junctions are found in locations such as the stomach or in the blood-brain barrier to stop substances from going across it. The third type of junction is called the gap junction. So you can see here you've got the plasma membrane of one cell and the plasma membrane of another cell. And in the, between the two, you've got these gaps which are like these channels or these pores that allow material to go in from one cell to another quite freely, right? So what uh, this uh, gap junction, a location of the gap junction is found in um, cardiac muscles, in muscles of the heart, and that they allow... Um, as I said, ions and other substances to flow directly from one cell to another, and that allows uh, the function of the heart to be coordinated um, quite well. When we talk about the different types of epithelial tissue, we can actually say that epithelial tissue can be organized based on either the, on both the number of cells found in the epithelial tissue as well as the shape of the cells at the top layer of the epithelial tissue. So, and uh, an epithelial tissue that is a simple epithelial tissue only has one layer. So out of this seven uh, or eight diagrams over here, you can see that this one only has one layer, this one also only has one layer, and the one right below it also has one layer. Epithelial tissue can contain two or more layers. So in the diagrams, if you look over here, you can say that um, that the uh, top picture on the right hand side is uh, contains two or more layers so that's the picture beneath it and the picture beneath that and then we've got pseudostratified which is a um, type of epithelial layer that is really one layer thick but it looks like it has more than one layer and the reason why it has it and and an example of an uh, pseudostratified epithelial layer is the picture on the bottom right hand corner. And the reason why it looks like it has more than one layer is that the, the uh, cells are different um, shape and the nuclei are at different heights, right? And so it looks like it's got more than one layer, but it really only has one layer. And then the fourth type of epithelial tissue that is based on the number of layers is the transitional epithelium, which can stretch um, and the uh, it changes um, the shape. So you can see here, this is a transitional epithelial and it looks like this when it's not stretch, whereas when it's stretch, it looks elongated. And so the location of transitional epithelia is within the um, urinary tract, in the bladder, and in other places within the urinary system. So number of layers describe uh, epithelial tissue. Another way of describing an epithelial tissue is the shape of the cells at the top layer. And so the first shape that I'm going to talk about is squamous. So the diagrams on the top left is uh, you've got the flat and thin shape of the tissue as is the diagram on the top right. The second shape of cells of uh, epithelial cell is cuboidal, which is boxy. So it's as wide as it is tall. And so the one, the second one down in the in the left um, column is an example, sorry, of an cuboidal um, epithelium, as well as a second one down on the right hand side. And then you've got columnar 
epithelium, which is rectangular. It's taller than it is wide. So an example of columnar epithelium is the one on the third um, ones down on both sides. So this one is rectangular, so it's columnar, as well as this one is also um, rectangular, re sorry, rectangular, so that it's columnar over there. And so when we put these two different um, naming uh, types based on number of layers and shape of cells, what we get is we get this. So we have the simple squamous epithelium that is involved in absorption and secretion. So it's found in the alve line, it lines the alveoli um, of the lungs, it lines the hearts, it lines the blood vessels, and it lines the lymphatic vessels. Um, stratified squamous epithelium is second. So you've got lots of layers and the top layer is flat. Um, and that offers protection, and they're found in these different parts of the body. Next one is the simple cuboidal. So simple means one layer. Cuboidal means that it's boxy in shape. And so you've got here, um, it's used for absorption and secretion, and you've got here where it's found. The fourth one is stratified, more than one layer, cuboidal. So it's boxy at the top. And again, any uh, stratified epithelium is um, good for protection. And so they're found in these locations. You've got simple columnar epithelium, so one layer taller than it is um, wide, um, found in these locations. And then you've got stratified columnar epithelium. So stratified, more than one layer. The top layer is rectangular taller than it is uh, wide, and it's found uh, in this layer. And you can see again one of the uh, functions of the stratified um, epithelium, um, columnar epithelium, is protection. And then the seventh one is the pseudostratified columnar epithelium. Again, the location, what it's used for, and then you've got the transitional epithelium that's found in the urinary tract. So it's also called the uro urothelium, and it allows the or urinary organs to expand and stretch depending on the volume of urine that's located within these spaces. Um, as I said, when you look at the overview of what each of this um, each of this uh, stratified epithelium do, you can see that protection is the top um, function of these epithelium, whereas with simple epithelium, it's involved in uh, absorption secretion over there. So there are some commonalities within these different types of epithelial tissue. And again, as we go through the course, we will actually examine each of these different types of uh, epithelium as we go through the multiple organ systems. So this describes um, membranous epithelium. We're going to go and talk about glandular epithelium next. So the way that we can um, categorize glandular epithelium is where they actually release their secretions. So if the secretions are released to the external environment, they are called exocrine secretions, whereas those glandular epithelium that release their secretions directly into surrounding tissues and fluids are referred to as endocrine secretions. Over here, what you can see is you can see the example of um, exocrine glands, so goblet cells that produce mucus, sweat cells, sweat glands that produce sweat, salivary glands that produce saliva, and mammary glands that produce uh, breast milk are all examples of exocrine glands. Whereas endocrine glands are um, uh, some examples are the anterior pituitary, uh, thymus, um, 
thyroid, sorry, uh, adrenal cortex, and the gonads. And each of these produces hormones. They release it into the bloodstream, as you can see over here. And then it the uh, the hormones then travel until it reaches uh, the target tissue and can have an effect on the target tissue. In terms of um, exocrine gland, there are three different types, uh, three different ways that the exocrine secretions are released um, into the external environment. So the first way is um, through merocrine secretion, and this is the most common type. And so what you can see here is that in the merocrine uh, exocrine glands, what you can see here is those exocrine um, secretions are um, packaged into the secretory vesicles. You can see over here the secretory vesicles uh, are transported towards the plasma membrane and then what happens is the vesicles fuse with the plasma membrane and then the exocrine secretions are then released. In this type of um, exocrine gland, there is very little damage to the cell. The second type of exocrine gland is called the apocrine secretion. And so in this, what happens is again, the exocrine uh, secretions are packaged in these vesicles, but instead of the vesicles actually um, um, connecting with a plasma membrane, what happens is that that part of the cell that contains those secretory vesicles is pinched off and then the secretions are released um, and it also causes um, relatively little damage to the cell. And so these are some examples of apocrine secretions. The third type are holocrine secretions. So again, they are released, they, the, the secretions are packaged in the secretory vesicles, but what happens is that those secretory vesicles are not um, released until and unless the, the cell get, becomes mature dies and ruptures. And so when the cell ruptures or explodes, then the entire cell is destroyed, right? So some examples of holocrine secretions are sebaceous gland on the skin and the hair. So we've got the different types of epithelial tissue. Um, here we've um, described the, the various different types in terms of shape, and um, number of layers as well as whether or not they're glandular um, epithelium. And so what I'm going to do is leave the epithelial tissue now and move on to the second tissue type, that is the connective tissue. When we go and look at the connective tissue, with the second, which is the second type of tissue that's found in the body, um, what we find out is that all connective tissues in the body help to support and connect with other tissues. The diagram up, up above is an example of a typical connective tissue. Um, and so most connective tissues um, have fibroblasts and fibrocytes. So when you look at the name fibroblast and fibrocytes, what you can see is that you, there is a, con, um, a common prefix. So fibro, and that refers to the fibers that they produce. And then the suffix, which is the second part of the name, you've got blast versus site. So when you've got something blast, it usually means that it's the um, active, younger version of the cell. So active in that it's actively um, either growing or actively producing things. So fibroblast uh, produces polysaccharides and proteins, including fibers. And then when the active, younger fibroblasts become more mature, then they um, become fibrocytes and they kind of settle down and they just maintain the structure of the connective, um, connective tissue. 
Um, adipocytes are also found part of connective tissue and adipocyte, so the word, the second um, half of this site refers to cell. Adipo refers to adipose tissue, which is fat. So adipocytes stores lipids in the cytoplasm. The second, uh, the another type of cell is called the mesen mesenchymal cells, and these are multipotent adult stem cells, so they can differentiate and produce more of the same type of cells. And we've also got macrophages as well as mast cells. So both macrophages and mast cells are part of the immune system. A macrophage will actually um, um, destroy, is a type of phagocyte, which destroys um, uh, foreign pathogens, whereas a mast cell contains these uh, granules that are filled with this chemical called histamine and heparin and mast cells are involved with the inflammatory response. So you can see here that unlike the epithelial tissue, the connective tissue contains a whole bunch of different cells, right? And they have a different type of uh, function. Within the connective tissue, um, connective tissues are not, unlike epithelial cells, they're not joined closely with each other because they're different types of um, cells and also because they are found within what we call the extracellular matrix over here. So the cells are kind of floating around and uh, depending on the type of connective tissue and the type of cells that are found within it, the connective tissue can either be fluid or can be solid, right? So when we look at the fibers that are produced by the fibroblast, there are three different types of fibers, right? That are produced by the fibroblast. So the first one is collagen fiber and collagen fibers are um, thick and, and long and straight. So they um, give the connective tissue flexibility with great strength. So it resists, it allows the connective tissue to resist stretching so it doesn't become overstretched or floppy and it's very strong, it's very resilient. The second type of fiber is called elastic fiber, which as its name suggests, um, allows the tissue to return to the original um, shape after it's either stretched, elongated, or compressed, right? So the elastic fiber has got different characteristics compared to the collagen fiber. The third fiber is called the reticular fiber, and if you can see here on the diagram, reticular fibers are fine um, strands, and so again, very similar in uh, composition to collagen fibers, except they are finer. And so again, flexible with great tensile strength, resist stretching, resilient, exactly the same properties as collagen fibers. But again, because they're thinner, they help to actually form a uh, mesh around um, organs. And then in between the cells and the fibers, you've got the ECM or the extracellular uh, matrix. And you can see over here that the extracellular matrix um, contains can contain uh, water, but also can contain proteins, polysaccharides, and other substances. Right, so they so the type of extracellular fluid um, that are found in, in different connective tissue depends on which connective tissue it's found in. So on that note, let's look at the different types of connective tissue. So you can see here, uh, connective tissues can be classified into three different categories: connective tissue proper, supportive connective tissue, and fluid connective tissue depends on the amount of um, extracellular fluid and ground substance, as well as the amount and type of fibers that are found within it. So we're going to go through each of these different types of connective tissue um, in the next few slides. So the first type of connective tissue is the loose connective tissue. 
two different types or three different types, adipose, areolar, and reticular connective tissue. So adipose refers to fat, right? Um, so you can see here in the adipose tissue, it's made largely of adipocytes, right? And remember, sites refers to cells, adipose refers to um, lipids. So adipocytes are found in adipose tissue, and the purpose of adipose tissue, fat tissue, is to store lipids. Second type of um, loose connective tissue is areolar tissue, and areolar tissues are um, organized in a random web-like fashion to fill spaces between different types of tissues, right? So it forms kind of like a, uh, a mesh, um, and uh, it fills different spaces. So very similar to the reticular tissue. So you can see here the reticular tissue contains a lot of reticular fibers. So those are those fine, strong, resilient fibers. And they, again, provide a mesh-like uh, supportive uh, framework for some of the soft organs in our body. The second type of connective tissue is the dense connective tissue. So as the name suggests, the dense connective tissue contains a lot of collagen fibers can, uh, compared to loose connective tissue, and these collagen fibers provide greater resistance to stretching, right? And so uh, some of these dense connective tissue can also contain some um, proportion of elastic fibers to help to retain its shape after stretching or compression. So in terms of dense connective tissue, we have dense um, regular connective tissue. Um, and I've just realized they are actually the opposite way around. in here. So dense regular connective tissue, what you can see here is that the fibers are arranged in neat little rows, right? So what happens is these neat little arrangements allows great strength in one direction. So an examples, a couple of examples of dense connective tissue are ligaments and tendons, right? The second type of dense connective tissue is dense irregular connective tissue. So same type of composition and everything. The only difference between dense regular and dense irregular is that in dense irregular, the fibers are arranged every which way. So you can see here the fibers are arranged every which way. And so what happens is it provides great strength in all directions right, in all directions. So some examples of dense connective tissue in our body is the underlying dermis in our skin and the walls of our arteries. And if you can think about your uh, arteries, they have to stretch to accommodate blood flowing through it and then relax when blood actually leaves it. And so they require um, these uh, fibers to be organized in um to be arranged in all different types of, in all different directions. So another kind of connective tissue is cartilage tissue. Cartilage tissue, like epithelial tissue, is also avascular. So it's got no blood vessels through it, which means that if you injure cartilage tissue, it takes a long time for it to heal because there's no blood vessels. And so what happens is the nutrients um, have to diffuse slowly from other um, connective tissue around the cartilage in order to reach the chondrocytes. In terms of the different components of cartilage, you've got um, these two different cells. So chondrocytes and chondroblasts are cells that are found within the cartilage tissue. And what you can see here is chondro refers to um, cartilage. 
whereas similar to fibroblast and fibrocytes, fibroblast, uh, chondroblast are the more active, developing, growing type of cartilage cells, whereas chondrocytes are the less active, more mature, more maintenance type of cartilage cells. You can also see here that the um, cells in the cartilage are surrounded by, um, are located within lacunae. So lacunae is a space that surrounds the chondrocytes and it contains fluid for um, exchange of nutrients and waste. Around the, uh, around the cartilage, we've got a protective layer um, and this is called the perichondrium. Peri means around, chondri refers to cartilage. Right? And we've also got the extracellular matrix um, that are consist of polysaccharides together with fibers. When we look at the types of cartilage, there are three main types. So the first one, the hyaline cartilage, is the most common. You can see here is that they've got some short dispersed uh, collagen fibers. They've got a lot of ground substances. They're strong and flexible. So these are the locations that they're found, some of the locations that they're found in our body. The second type of cartilage is called the elastic cartilage. So it also contains those collagen and proteoglycans that are found in hyaline cartilage, but it also has some elastic fibers. And so the elastic fibers provided some elasticity so that it can regain its, for, uh, its previous shape after it's been stretched or compressed or bent out of shape, right? So an example of elastic cartilage is found in our ex external ear. The third type of cartilage is called fibrocartilage. And so in this type of cartilage, what happens is the collagen fibers are organized into thick, thick bundles. And so it means that the fibrocartilage is the toughest and most resistant to damage out of the three different types of cartilage. And fibrocartilage is found as part of our knee joint to and as well as in between the vertebrae in our back and this actually helps our body support our weight. Next type of connective tissue is the bone. I'm going to talk about it very briefly here because we have a whole lecture on bone tissue. So as you know the bone is the hardest connective tissue um, in our body and the function of bone is to support the body as well as to protect internal um, internal organs. Our, the extracellular matrix uh, that's found in bone is made, is rigid, is hard, is solid, and it's made out of organic compounds, collagen fibers embedded in a mineralized ground substance containing inorganic compounds. And the inorganic compounds that are found in bone are, are these hydroxy uh, apatite, which are a form of calcium phosphate, right? So again, that's, this is why calcium intake is so important for good, strong, healthy bones. Like chondrocytes in cells, um, bone cells are called osteocytes and the younger version of these bone cells are called osteoblasts. And these bone cells are located within a, a lacunae, similar to the chondroblasts and chondrocytes of the cartilage. Bone is a highly vascularized tissue Bone is a highly vascularized tissue, and so when you break your bone, it's um, relatively quick to actually recover from injuries compared to a, um, a vascular tissue such as cartilage. That's all I'm going to say on 
bone tissue because like I said, we're going to talk about it in a um, another lecture soon. The Another type of, uh, um, the last type of connective tissue that I'm going to talk about is fluid connective tissue. So we've got two different types of fluid connective tissue in our body, blood and lymph fluid. So blood flows within blood vessels within uh, arteries, between, within veins, within capillaries, whereas lymphatic fluid is found within our lymphatic system. Um, and um, what you can see here in the diagram in the right is that the, um, the vascular system, which contains blood, and the lymphatic system, which contains um, fluid are very interwoven. So you can see here you've got lymphatic capillaries located in the same general region as blood capillaries, right? So again, that's all I'm going to talk about in terms of fluid connective tissue because we're going to talk about it more when we actually come to the relevant um, sections of this course. The third type of tissue that is found in our body is our muscle tissues. So again, just one slide just to give you a brief overview. Um, so the muscle tissue in our body allows um, us and our body parts to move. They respond to stimuli, so they are excitable, and they can contract and relax in order to move stuff around, right? Either our body, our body parts, or things contained within um the various tissue types. There are three different types of muscle tissue. The first type is skeletal, so associated with bones. Skeletal um, tissue is voluntary. It produces heat, it protects organs, it moves our body and our body parts. The second type of tissue is cardiac tissue, which is found in the heart. Luckily for us, we don't have to force our heart to move. Our heart beats involuntarily without any conscious control or, uh, on our part. And the purpose of the uh, cardiac tissue is to pump blood um, through our heart and through our vascular system. And then the third type of tissue is a smooth, a uh, third type of muscle is a smooth muscle. So you can see here it's short, spindle shaped. Um, it's got no evident striation, so it's not arranged in bands of light and dark. And this is also controlled involuntarily, right? So we have smooth muscle um, in a lot of our internal organs, in our esophagus, in our stomach, in um, our bronchi, in the respiratory system, um, throughout throughout the um, throughout the body, and so it's good that it's involuntary. Again, we're going to talk about muscles when we come to that part of this course. And then the fourth type of tissue in our body is the nervous tissue. Um, and so the nervous tissue, like muscle, is excitable. It can send and receive electrical signals that provide the body with information. It communicates, um, it allows communications between different parts of our body. Um, and it's vital for our body to actually work together as a whole. In terms of the different cells that are found within nervous tissue, it can be um, separated out into two main uh, categories, neurons that are the working part of the nervous uh, system and neuroglia, which are the supporting part of our nervous system. So you've got the neurons over here. So signal comes in here from the dendrites, processed over here, and then sent down through the axon to cause release of neurotransmitters at the axon terminal. And then um, in the second diagram over here, you've got four different types of neuroglia or support cells that are found in the central nervous system. So I hope that you've learned something from this lecture and I'll see you again soon.